welcome. I'm bringing Brooklyn in the house. Come on in. Okay, cameras are speeding. I started this show in 2009 with Brooklyn Savvy set in different living rooms. So the best way to celebrate 20 seasons is to bring it home, literally. I wanted to create a safe space to have uncomfortable yet transformative conversations that move people, amplifying the voices of those who are underrepresented and who inspire positive change. I'm Tony Williams, and this is Brooklyn Savvy. Brooklyn Savvy is a show about transformative conversations that unpack the myths and misconceptions so we can begin to see each other and the parts that we play. It's about changing hearts and minds through the power of storytelling. It's about doing the work to be mentally free. Asking yourself interrogating questions, the why, what happened to me? Am I the one that needs to change? There are so many standards and stereotypes that exist within the community stemming from oppression and trauma. In this episode, we unpack what real community healing and intervention should look like. I, I wanna ask each of you. Why do you think black people perpetuate violence against each other? Uh, thanks for having me, Tony. Mm -hmm. And I think it's, it's two reasons. It's self-hate and it's fear. Ooh. It's self-hate because we are in a society that uh, stigmatizes and degrades just being black in general. So if you're constantly moving in a place where you're at a lower, uh, you know, a lower stature in life, then you're going to manifest that hate, mm -hmm. right, in oneself. It's also fear because we also know the sort of crabs in the barrel mm, type yes. scenario. Sure. So mm -hmm. if some of us are moving up and others are coming along, yeah. then there's going to be attention to us as a whole. Mm -hmm. And that fear that the individual who's not at the sort of higher level or the authoritative level or the, is, is to push folks back. And sometimes that manifests in, mm -hmm. in violence. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Phyllis? So this is something that has always disturbed me. And uh, for a long time, I couldn't understand it. I do believe, however, we are part of uh, a society that continuously degrades us. Mm -hmm. We get all of those mental, pi those pictures uh, from the time we're children um, telling us who we are. And, it go and, and somehow you take it in whether you recognize, realize it or not. And if there's not something countering that, and I say that because I, I think our parents yes, can our do homes, that, our, family our families right. can do that. If there's not something countering that, I think we absorb it. Mm -hmm. mm. and, then when, and then there's this anger and frustration that we may, that we probably do have, and so we take it out on those that are closest to us so yeah. we talk about those in our community, and there you see the, the black on so black. the proximity, yeah. right? And the affinity. Yeah. What do you think, uh, Christina? You know, it's interesting because I grew up in a black country, a mm -hmm. predominantly black country in Jamaica, and even though I grew up in a family that taught me that I could be whatever I wanted to be and I had a lot of love and support, even in my own country, the self-hatred that we have there Mm -hmm. Whether it is grandmothers telling you know their their children to put clothes pin on the child's nose when they're oh. born so they look less black, or mm -hmm. it is the bleaching that happens in our country for people feeling like they'll get more opportunities if they were lighter skinned. I mean, you know, it's almost like it's genetic memory because what has been it's drilled into the pores. It's within our DNA, unfortunately, that we see ourselves. Um, within very small deficit spaces because mm. we weren't given the opportunity to imagine larger spaces that we could encompass so much more. We have been caged physically and mentally. Ooh, you know, that was, I don't know if there's much left for me to say, <laughs> except that I've always felt that 
you know, you can't put me down. I've got to give you permission to do that. Yeah. You know, and, and that's something that I find in this country when people try to look at you from a deficit mindset. Yeah, you look at me that way, but guess what? I don't see myself that way, mm -hmm. and I'll never allow that. But what we're going to do is bring on our expert, so Dr. Tracy it. Norris. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Tracy, for coming on. <laughs> Tracy, so wonderful to have you here and your voice. Why do you think that black people, that we commit violence against each other and that we don't even invest in each other for the most part? You know, when we get into positions of power, sometimes we don't do. Well, we've seen that. We've seen that many times. Well, we don't really, we're not there for the self-interest of our black brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. We're there for our own interests. Can you, can you speak to that? Yes. Well. Um, criminality is a symptom of society. So people that engage in violence, black people that engage in black on black violence are essentially victims harming victims. Mm -hmm. Victims of racism, mm -hmm. white supremacy who have been trained to hate and denigrate one another and so they will enact violence on their own people. Uh, also violence is a symptom of uh, powerlessness and insignificance. Mm -hmm. And those of us who feel powerless and insignificant are going to uh, act the only way we know how, physically, through violence. It's, it's, a, it's essentially frustration. And so you also live in a society where uh, in all areas of people activity, we are trained to hate one another. Mm. Uh, we are trained to hate the image that looked like us. You know, uh, dark-skinned people, or people with you know, curly hair, uh, their negative images, all in uh, print media, movies, television. That's a little bit of that is changing. But historically speaking, everything uh, associated with black or darkness was uh, viewed as negative. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about trauma, because that's a word that we're hearing about all over the place. It's starting to sound like love, where it's this big basket. What is community trauma, and how is that depicted in the way that we treat each other? Mm -hmm. Well, trauma, uh, singularly speaking, is a psychological wound that uh, occurs when there's been a, an event that cannot be uh, metabolized, that cannot be uh, processed. And so the person who is traumatized cannot process what, is ha what has happened to them, and so they are stuck. Uh, and then you talk about a group of people who uh, collectively are being traumatized every which way mm -hmm. uh, through structural racism. And so you talk about a community that is essentially stuck. And you can see it in our behavior, the way we act in our communities, the way we treat one another. These are uh, expressions of traumatic behavior. However, in the media, um, it is viewed as uh, a deficit in character, if you will, mm. or that we're an inferior people mm -hmm. um, versus really understanding the historical context of the behavior as well as what is happening in today's society that perpetuates that behavior. Talk mm. to us about the historical piece to this, because we've spoken about Willie Lynch. If you could just elaborate on that. Yeah. Well, Willie Lynch is the, uh, I think this was a slaver, slave owner um, years ago who wanted to come up with a method to ensure that black people would be uh, separate from one another and not come together to uh, challenge chattel slavery. And so essentially what uh, he did was train uh, white slave owners to pit older black people against younger black people, light-skinned black people against dark-skinned black people, those of us who worked in the kitchens versus those of us who worked in the fields, uh, in every which way possible to ensure that we would be in conflict with one another, men against women, uh, parents against children, uh, on and on and on, and that still is prevalent today. You can see it in television, and it's it's purported through kind of jokes and entertainment, but in actuality, you can see it in commercials where they make uh, one one of the pair of the couple, you know, you know, seem stupid, uh, you know, and laugh about it. It's very subtle, but it's still very prevalent today. Are we not complicit in some of these behaviors, though? I mean, I'm thinking about rap music. Now, of course, not all of it is derogatory, but much of it is. So w what's with the self-denigration that we seem to be okay with? Well, uh, <laughs> I would say, if you think about it, uh, the rap industry 
in, initially, we, we didn't have, that was not something that black people owned. And, you know, to be famous or to have an opportunity to uh, make money and take care of your family, there were very few avenues of uh, success available for black people, you know, entertaining, sports, and that sort of thing. So rap music not being any different was one of those uh, areas. However, we didn't own or control how we were going to uh, present our music. And what is not so obvious is that uh, we were told uh, that you had to say certain lyrics. So the idea is not that we just went and said all these uh, derogatory things uh, uh, on our own, but we were uh, coerced, if you will. You have Wait. to say this. You're blowing yes. my mind, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, go ahead, <laughs> I'm processing. So MWA was told? What? Well, I'm not calling out any specific okay. group. <laughs> I was just thinking of them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying, though, when you go to uh, you go into these um, the offices of people that you're trying to sell, sell, sell your demo to, they may listen to it and say, "Yeah, no, that's great, but mm. you know, throw bitch in there, right? Mm. Okay. Or throw mm. the N word, or throw that in there, jazz it up." And so, mm. you know, you're a young kid, or you're hungry, and you know, this is your dream to be an entertainer, and so you'll do it. They'll throw a few bucks at you. And then it becomes normalized. I feel that there is a tremendous role for self-awareness and healing from trauma. And I, I'm not a professional. I can just share with you what I've read. Meditation helps. These are tough conversations that force us to look at ourselves as a community. Let's talk about what we're here to speak about, which is this whole area of community trauma. So why don't we first start, Alicia? by talking about what is trauma. Sure, um, in our work at FPWA, uh, we recognize trauma to be harmful experiences um, that people in the community go through on a daily basis. Now that could be on a small scale, but that can also be on a large scale. So when you talk about community trauma, what we're really looking at is the, the, the negative impact for a whole entire community, right? So it's trauma that, goes beyond an individual experience, beyond a family experience, and it reaches an entire community. And mostly that is based off of their shared experiences and as it relates to uh, structural violence mm -hmm. and oppression. Now, but, but I want to talk also about what it means to be traumatized. Phyllis, you want to in, in insert in here? Well, trauma, when someone's traumatized, it's when something happens outside of you that you don't have the emotional uh, resources to manage. So, um, Tony, you and I could be standing in the room and see something that is disturbing. It might, I might be traumatized by it and you might not be. It's highly individualized. If you had the resources to manage uh, whatever that incident was, you'd be okay. But if I didn't, then I would be traumatized. So basically- now, now My question is, when we talk about a community being traumatized and we talk about historical trauma, is it something that people readily believe? Because oftentimes folks want to blame communities for the situations that they find themselves in. So can, can you respond to that? Is sure. it, you know, the studies, the evidence that supports what it is mm -hmm, that you're saying? Mm -hmm. Sure, it, it, it is a controversial topic, especially in the society that we live in today, which is very much based on individualism, mm -hmm. right? But we know uh, from a historical perspective that community trauma is real, right? It is about the intentional uh, structural violence that a targeted group of people experience. So we look at experiences like slavery, for example, mm -hmm. or even as recent as raids on immigrant communities, or the mm. unarmed, or the killing mm. of unarmed black women and mm. black men in our communities, right? And we know that to be real. Mm -hmm. We didn't imagine it mm -hmm. to happen. And so even though in this society where uh, individualism uh, is 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 prevalent and and predominant, we know that. 
uh, in communities, especially poor communities of color, that people have been dealing with these issues for years, navigating the systems that have been set up to help us. And hmm. so when they have difficulty navigating those situations, right, it takes away from their individual ability to make the decisions that they need, have the resources that they need. And let's not even talk about how communities of color are under-resourced, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And how they don't have the infrastructure necessary to build those supports on. So how is this trauma passed down? Because if you're talking about community trauma, you are talking about something that has, on some level, has to be passed right. down. It can be generational as well, mm -hmm. and it stays within a community, within a family many times because of the support networks and, and what is unique to each family, what they've lived and how they've coped with it. Coping skills come into play. Um, whatever resources are or are not available, as you mentioned. So it does get passed on. It, it You know, with trauma, you develop a lot of different symptoms. Also, depending on the level of trauma, you could have anxiety. Anxiety, PTSD, you've seen on different levels. Community, it could be individuals, it could be children, it could be individuals that live in a community that are traumatized from fear, from violence, from, you know, there's so many facets of that. And that's where you do see it passed down. It depends on how the family has coped in dealing it on the first generation and then how it's been passed down. You know, Johnny, be safe when you go outside. I'm just saying if it's community mm -hmm. violence, that child has now been raised with that fear of going outside and what he or she sees around them and how they're going to cope. So it can go on and on that way until there's an intervention, which could be hopefully on the community level or within the resources of that particular family in and, coping. And also, what happens is often there's a learned helplessness. Yep. Mm -hmm. So trauma, of people that are traumatized, then they start feeling not really very powerful. It takes right. away your power. So if you feel helpless and you, you just can't move. So very often when even the resources are there, you are not taking advantage of them. You're caught in this cycle. And I think that that's what happens very often in communities that oh. have had a lot of um, negative impact. What about the brain science? And I'm not sure anyone here can speak to it, but d does it get into your DNA some kind of way, which I find that's really pretty amazing. Whether it's genetic or not, I don't think that there have been such studies that that detailed in, in mm -hmm. finding that, but mm -hmm. definitely behavioral patterns have been set up. And, you know, as far as how communities and families cope, um, symptoms have been established that are very common depending on the anxiety or the pressure of what they're, what each individual is living, their threshold for tolerance, trust. You know, again, there's a lot of the empowerment, feeling the disabled and stuck. So there's a whole host of clinical symptoms wow. that are there that are a part of that, you know, kind of um, uh, dependency on the symptoms they're living. It, it just becomes a pattern of a norm for generation to generation. And lifelong yeah. uh, repercussions for right. this. You, we see with childhood trauma especially, Absolutely. lifelong um, repercussions of that type of trauma. Um, real health outcomes, negative yes. health outcomes that last a lifetime. And right. many times those can get passed down throughout generations yes. as well. So there are many facets. Right. And because is, you may not be aware as a parent that you're even say. passing this down. Absolutely. Right. And it's some of what we've already been talked about um, in terms of family having response and default response mechanism to what is happening. And if they don't know they're traumatized, like, let's be real, like, this wasn't a term that existed, like, when my parents were raising me. Right. And so right. they didn't know they were traumatized, although they had a history of, you know, being in the Jim Crow South. And if they then pass on their beliefs, their coping mechanisms, as was mentioned mm -hmm. to me, like, then that becomes part of who I am, mm -hmm. right? It is part of who I see myself in the world. It is part of how I navigate the world, mm -hmm. right? I don't navigate the world on my own terms because all of this information has then been kind of driven into me. And so, um, so I think how we- how do we disrupt this? Mm -hmm. Because it, you know, it almost sounds as, okay, I'm a victim, I'm powerless, a lot of kind of, they're negative. That's mm -hmm. a lot of negativity. So how do we build any kind of spirit of resiliency? And I imagine it must first start with the people and then it broadens the community? There are a variety of ways that we can go about addressing some of this. Um, some of this talk, you know, 
you spoke about some interventions earlier and, and looking at systems that are designed to intervene, um, access to those systems, how do we increase access to those systems, and how do we train those systems to ensure that they are not themselves re-traumatizing people. Talk to us about what that looks like. <laughs> right, so that's some of the work that we do at FPWA. Um, Alicia leads on the programmatic side, and we have some policy work that we do as well, um, looking at some of these systems. So at FPWA specifically, we look um, at the human services sector. So we look at organizations that are designed to really be on the front lines to provide services and access to services. But what does it look like when those organizations are either not trained in trauma themselves mm -hmm. and trauma-informed care, and so they don't know how to approach communities. They don't know how to approach individuals who may be traumatized. Um, but then what does it also look like when those organizations themselves can re-traumatize people? Um, how about that? Right. Mm -hmm. right. right. Well, cultural mm -hmm. sensitivity is a mm -hmm. very big um, portion of that. And um, how to understand the client that's coming to you and the nuances of what they're trying to say and respecting that and, mm -hmm. and respecting therapy or any intervention within those particular boundaries of, of the culture and, and also trust and, and the, you know, being able to encompass trust for the patient or the person reaching for the help and also empowering them and giving them hope and giving them options, putting the control back in their hands. So that's a lot that, you know, I think trained d depends on the program and who the service delivery person or people or organization is, is so there's a lot of specific clinical, I think, um, issues that arise from helping and not re-traumatizing. And then I would also yeah. add to that, you know, also thinking about the community as being the expert in what they need. So when we talk mm -hmm. about disrupting patterns, right. Mm -hmm. right, right, we need to figure out what are the solutions. But mm -hmm. those solutions have to be based in a community vision, right. right? If you're outside the community, you can't create solutions for that community and expect sure. for them to work. And mm -hmm. so we have to see communities as resilient and vibrant, mm -hmm. even in the midst of the, the oppression and the trauma. Yes. yes. Right. Sure. Talk to us about the ACEs study, though, in, in terms of so that our viewers can understand those those experiences that create trauma in, in lives. So I think it was in the early 90s, I want to say, um, that the ACEs study was released. And ACEs stands for Adverse Childhood Experiences. And it's really important that people understand that. Absolutely, adverse childhood right? Experiences, absolutely, because right? mm -hmm. this, as it was mentioned, uh, you know, when children experience this level of violence, it carries through their entire lives. And so what the study looked at was it looked at isolated incidences happening within families, right? Divorce and violence and sexual abuse. And what the study ultimately says is that if you have a certain amount of ACEs, you are more likely mm. to be living in trauma, experience mental health issues and health issues in general and be living in poverty. And um, that was kind of groundbreaking, right? And so um, since that time, other organizations have begun to use that work as a, as a foundational block. Like out in California, they even created adverse community experience. Mm -hmm. So extending it beyond just the individual level and looking at what those experiences do commu to communities. Because when you have even, I think it's more than two or three ACEs, you know, on this survey, then you are more likely to experience trauma. So imagine a community mm -hmm. full of people, mm -hmm. right, that have more than two or three or five, and some in some instances, 10 across the board. Wow. They, they mm -hmm. are impacted by all these things. And the ACEs study also showed the correlation between trauma and health mm -hmm. uh, outcomes. Mm -hmm. So people that had a high level of ACEs on a score, high score, they were more likely to die of uh, heart trouble, mm -hmm. cancer. And actually, they went as far as to say that people that have a really high ACE score uh, generally die up to 20 years younger mm -hmm. than your average person. So, I mean, there's a huge there's a huge um, information around that in schools when people look at the teachers look at why children are not um, doing well. Children that have a high ACEs score are have a really difficult time concentrating in class. There's a higher level of them uh, not even finishing school. So it really answers a lot of questions 
Uh, and one of the things that I think is important is education. Mm -hmm. Because once we talk about this, once we understand how pervasive trauma is within and our And take it community. seriously. Not take like, oh, uh, trauma, oh, you're not coming. <laughs> you ain't traumatized. Right. You know, it's an excuse. Yes, exactly. Right. Yeah, once mm -hmm. we figure out how to respond appropriately, then we have a better chance of really mitigating all of the effects of trauma. And one thing that the ACEs study really helped to begin to shape a conversation where uh, children were being asked what happened to you, as opposed to the thinking about what's wrong with you? Why can't you sit down? Why can't Ooh, you listen? Yeah. Ooh, you know, Ooh, now it's yes. what what happened to you? Let's, let's talk about what hmm. you know is going on at home. A let's talk about what you might have changing the conversation right. to what That's happened, right. as opposed to putting it That's back right. on you. Yeah. Now, the role of poverty. I was reading, and I, I basically want opinions on this. It had to do: Does America hate poor people? And so I'd like to hear both of y'all's opinions on that. Does America hate poor people? <laughs> I mean, I would say that it, it has Or despise. Let's, let's say despise. Let's say that, that might be better than hate. Yeah. Right. I, I mean, historically, when you look back at the setup of our social welfare system here and how we have historically managed poverty in the United States back from the very beginning, um, no, we haven't been showing a lot of love and support to those who are at the bottom of our economic rungs. So, you know, we always have this distinction between the worthy and the unworthy poor. Mm -hmm. Who actually deserves help in our society? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. we, we make those distinctions very clear. And, and those definitions have been evolving over time. So it used to be back at the beginning of our country that if you were a widow or you were a child, that you were worthy of assistance. But now even that has, has evolved to, well, if you have a job, huh. then maybe you deserve assistance. But even now, when you look at some of the earning levels of people, it's not even if you have a job, if you have a, a relatively well-paying job. So, you know, this is a constantly shifting definition of who we determine in this country actually deserves assistance and who does not. Hmm. Um, and we see that playing out in our communities every day. You know, Alicia talked about the historic pervasive trauma of, of the history of racism in this country. We talk about the trauma associated with poverty frequently overlaps with communities of color. Um, and it, it just intensifies that trauma, the trauma of not having housing that is stable, of constantly moving and losing mm -hmm. your support systems. Mm -hmm. You know, that trauma is very real. And it, it's throughout family systems. Um, and is, would poverty be considered a trauma? Absolutely. So, so, and then when we think about poverty and the pipeline to prison, can you speak about how that, the intersection and how that sort of plays out in some of these communities that have trauma? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Look, communities of color are absolutely targeted by our criminal justice system. Mm -hmm. You can't say otherwise. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's very clear when you look at the data. Um, and based on some of the, the research FPWA has done recently, there is an absolute correlation between poverty and criminal justice mm -hmm. involvement. Um, there are entry points throughout um, living in poverty that bring you directly into the criminal justice system. You can't afford a Metro card, right. and so you jump the right. turnstile, right. Right. and that brings you right into the system. Can't afford bail. Can't afford, afford bail. Right, and so right. instead of being released, you are sitting in a, you know, a prison. When what does that do not only to the individual, the trauma of being incarcerated, but to the entire family system? Um, and we are, we're not talking about that as, as a community. We're not talking about how we are traumatizing entire families, entire communities mm. with our criminal justice system. Let's unpack. Let's dig deep, let's be accountable, let's be responsible. Let us change the way that we think because we'll be able to change our lives. Let us heal, that's the savvy way to go. We will see you next time on Brooklyn Savvy.